This is Sienna, and you are listening to the King of the Mountain Podcast. Hi, this is Allie, and you're listening to the King of the Mountain Podcast. One to the two, two to the three, and the place to be. It is the King of the Mountain Podcast. I am your host, as always, BQ, and I hope this podcast finds everybody well. We had a couple really solid episodes of Impact back to back now. The episodes before that, the set of tapings before that, they had their moments, but this this one's off to a really good start, in my opinion. I thought Destination X was the best show of the year, and I thought this one was really, really good too. If you're talking all the way up to the gauntlet, it was probably in a fairly average show because it was mainly story storyline stuff. But I thought the gauntlet was booked really, really well. Um, I saw one site say that it was, you know, not even close to their best gauntlet ever. I, I thought this was great. I thought it was booked better than most Royal Rumbles. Uh, excuse me. I know I say I don't really watch the product, but the last I, I watched the Rumble all the way up to when AJ debuted. So I've seen quite a few of them. And uh, I thought, yeah, and I'm not saying it's bigger or better than the Royal Rumble. That's not what I'm getting at. But they really, I think they really captured a good big fight feel here that they haven't done with a gauntlet in a long time. But if you're familiar with like the term pound for pound, you know, Trevor Lee's the strongest pound for pound wrestler in the company. I think they, I don't know if they still say that about Cesaro. If you follow the NBA, Isaiah Thomas is pound for pound the greatest player in the history, at, you know, but he's 5'8 or 5'9. So you understand the reference. So for what the gauntlet was to Global Force Wrestling and what the Rumble is to a you know bigger company in WWE, I thought this gauntlet was just done much better. I can't believe it. No one was you know we're gonna get into the gauntlet a little bit later, you know. But there was no jo- no one aside from Dick Justice, but we'll get to that too. No one was treated as a joke. No one was. No one went in there as a jobber. Even the jobbers. So that's what I really appreciated. You know, they took, you know, pretty much every single entrance seriously. But we are going to get that, get to that in a little bit. I need you to subscribe. Be a subscriber on whatever platform you're listening to me on. I just hit 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. It was done about a week before I expected. Um, It was done, and it was done about probably two or three weeks before the ultimate goal. So I'm really excited about that. When I kicked off with the podcast, um, you know, because I went on the long hiatus and I only had like 320 subscribers as of June. So we have kicked this thing up a notch quite a bit as I've come back. And I actually hit record. I I hit a lot of records this week, but I had the one that's important to me is I hit record uh, listenership for the impact review and i'm not up there competing with you know i'm going to be transparent with you guys i'm not up there competing with you know bruce pritchard and uh jim Cornette because i'm at the end of the day i'm still a fan run podcast but uh you know a year ago year and a half ago when i was when the podcast was working with tna mecca you know we were doing 800 listeners to the impact review a week and then things kind of fell off with them and I went on the hiatus, and when I came back from my hiatus, uh, I only had 150 listeners that week, and I was really worried that I was gone too long, and that the podcast wasn't going to survive. So I sat there and said, "Okay, put your money where your mouth is. You're a marketer. You know social media. Make this happen." S- said this to myself, conversation with myself, and we've kicked things up a notch. And the podcast is doing really well. And again, to be transparent, we exceeded uh, exceeded 900. So it's been the highest listened to ever. And the goal has always been for me to, to have 1,000 a a per uh, show. So good things. And uh, I think we're going to be in a, in a really good place at the end of this year. So please hit subscribe wherever you're listening to me. If you're listening to me on Apple Podcasts, I would appreciate a five-star review and uh rating hit up kotmpodcast.site site if you 
the the best way to know when the podcast comes out because it, it gets updated every Sunday is you know I have the link for Podbean up and I have the link for YouTube up because those are those are my best platforms. So if you don't want to search on YouTube or search on Podbean or Apple Podcasts, whatever it is, you know, every Sunday you'll find an update. And there's the vlog. There's a mailing list sign up. I'm not doing much with the mailing list at the moment because I'm waiting for it to get a little bit bigger. If you're on Facebook, make sure to hit, hit up the Impact Fan Zone, impact, re, facebook.com slash Impact Wrestling FZ. It's truly the best place on Facebook for Global Force fans because there's no spoilers. If there is spoilers, they will let you know in the post. So they'll say don't click on the comments. So it's not like some of these other groups that just put all that stuff out there. Don't forget to check out the Sienna interview and the Alley interview. These interviews are very different. I went on a rant last podcast about them. I conduct my interviews what's respectful to their character and what's respectful to the fans too. I want to do, you know, I want to do something the fans want to hear, but I want to give a podcast that the wrestlers want to give as well. I've kind of done a semi rebrand of this channel. It's no longer King of the Mountain Radio. We're just keeping it simple. It's King of the Mountain Podcast. Everything that I do on the channel, if you're listening, I'm, I'm talking YouTube here is King of the Mountain Podcast. There's just the Impact Review. You know, there are different segments. There's Talking Armageddon, Global Force Roundup, BQ Speaks, etc. So it's everything is the King of the Mountain Podcast. We're going to keep it real, real simple. And it's just broken up into different different sections. I'm going to uh, Indie Wrestling tonight, NWL in St. Louis. It's going to be my first time going out there. And uh, ACH is going to be there. And my son likes him. And I do my best to deliver all my son's favorites to him, you know, get a chance to meet them, take a picture, all that good stuff. So we're heading that way for ACH. I know triple mania is tonight. I know the fights tonight, uh, but the sun comes first. So, you know, we want to try to make that happen and hopefully I can, uh, catch the other shows as well. I almost didn't watch this show. It's not that I didn't want to, I couldn't. So right now our only, uh, the only TV in our house that has cable because a cable guy messed up is in our bedroom and the other day my cat was under the bed and he's not supposed to be in the room so I lay down on the ground and I took the remote control and I, I slid it at him like to hit him and it hit him and he took off running and so <laughs> I went to the other side of the bed to go get him and after I got him out of the room I looked under the bed and the the remote control was missing like it magically disappeared and there's nothing else under the bed um, I, every day I get down there, I lay down and I look for the damn control, but I hadn't done it for a little while. So I went in the room, was getting ready to watch impact. It's like, Oh shit, I don't have a control. So I got down again and I'm looking, I was like, where the hell did this controller go? Like it literally disappeared into thin air. I, I slid it about two feet. You know, like our bed is, we have a pretty good sized bed, but come on. But, uh. We have a second controller that ended up working, so I was able to turn on the show. Good lord. Uh, yeah, so before getting an impact review, I had a really long week, and the reason I'm even getting to getting into this is, is just my way of telling you guys there's no excuses to follow your dreams or make things happen, or, or there's always time for stuff that you want to make time for. So... Right now I'm on my I'm on military orders for two weeks. So when you hear about the reserves and they say one weekend a month, two weeks a year, like I'm on my two weeks right now. It's split up into uh, 15 working days. So it, you know the weekends don't count. So I'm I'm at work for you know about three weeks. I have to get up at about five in the morning. We have to wake the kids up because right now we're only using one car because the great state of Florida has suspended my driver's license. Because they think I'm behind in child support, but I'm not. I've never missed a payment. I deal with this problem every three months. They always suspend my license, and then I have to go in the office and be like, I'm not behind child support. Okay, yeah, yeah, and they fix it in the computer, and I get my license back. But now we live in Illinois, and I got that damn notice, but the problem is the Florida office doesn't have a phone. So I have to talk to the Department of Revenue. They don't know how to get in contact with these people, so... My license has been suspended for a couple weeks now, so now we have to share a car until I figure out how to contact this office. And so we have to wake up 5 a.m., get the kids up. My drive to work is about 45 minutes. You know, I have a full day of work there. 
the wifey has to, uh, you know, pick up the kids and then come pick me up again. You know, we get home you know, five o'clock, whatever. Uh, it's almost time to start making dinner for the kids. Kids got homework, whatever. Put them to bed. And then I have, I'm a full-time college student. So I've got that going on as well. And then I have this podcast, which, you know, I do the impact review religiously, also obviously, but then I have a couple days out of the week that, you know, obviously I, I do other content on the channel. So I used to be good about four or five days of content. Now I'm, I'm doing about two days of extra content on the channel, but I have a, you know, I have a pretty full-time life. There's not a whole lot of, a lot of free time, but I still find a way to make it happen. Being a full-time student, working full-time, having, you know, being a full-time family man and doing this podcast. So no excuses out there, folks. I'm doing today's podcast solo because uh, this was just a weird po- weird episode for me to do, to have a guest host on. So usually this is the part where I introduce my guest host and say it's this and this. But I'm going to go solo today because there was only two matches on the show and I felt like the gauntlet, like really talking about the gauntlet the way that I want to, was going to be really awkward going back and forth. Um, so we're going to do a little bit different today. And uh, next week, Terrence from Southeast will be on. He'll be my guest host, and I really like working with him. I think him and I have good chemistry. So, again, doing it solo. I thought that the audio on this episode of Impact was really good. I've complained numerous times about the crowd volume and the ring volume and everything being so compressed and the announcer volume being so loud. And last tapings was was probably the worst job they've ever done audio wise because you couldn't hear anything now you guys are hearing what the impact zone kind of really sounds like granted there's a lot more people on these two uh episodes these two past episodes but you're you're starting to hear now when you hear the chants and stuff like that that's kind of more what the volume is like in there so i'm really happy about that and it sounds really good from what i understand the next two tapings uh they were the ones that took place on uh, no, I'm wrong. Not the next two, but uh, I believe the uh, not the next two, but the next two after that. The crowd is supposed to be really, really good. From what I understand, the crowd was fairly good for the whole set of tapings, except for the um, the night the Royal Rumble, not the Royal Rumble, I'm sorry, that SummerSlam was on. I don't know exactly what the size of the crowd was. I was just told it could have been better, but it wasn't too bad. But you know, you have to you have to believe going up against. SummerSlam, like it's pretty difficult to uh, to fill it up in there because there are people who watch both products. But again, I really love the show. The opening segment with uh, Team America, fuck yeah, fuck yeah, aka America's Top Team and uh, Dan Lambert, I thought was masterful. It felt like it felt real, it felt like real life, and I think it was really refreshing in a world that we, you know, we get PG wrestling. <laughs> Uh, you can't get what they did here. You can't get on another wrestling program. And I'm, I was right in saying that I think they're going a direction of of trying to incorporate realism, because they're taking real, you know, things really going on in really real life. You know, hence because this whole top team thing, this is really happening, but they're just making a storyline out of it. And you can't get this on another show. I mean, you turn on a. Lucha Underground, which I, I like very much, but it's all fantasy. It's banned in 49 states. Raw is, you know, watching Sesame Street to a, in a sense, you know, when you're talking pro wrestling. And uh, Ring of Honor, there's realism with that too, but but kind of not. I mean, I, you know. And with New Japan, that feels, feels really, really real. So if you've watched the GFW Amp Anthology, you see that that's kind of what they're going for because watching amped i felt like we were watching a ufc fight or something it felt it felt like it was real competition so i think they're going that direction but they're doing it little by little i thought this was masterful uh the arguing sounded really real between dan lambert and jeff jarrett like that sounded like two motherfuckers really arguing some of america's top team aren't the best actors in the world but but they're doing a pretty good job with this James Storm coming out and dropping f bombs and I had to rewind that segment. I you know with my with my uh, control, I just hit rewind and then I hit pause and I got the wife because she wasn't watching with me. I was like, you got to see this. 
And she walked away saying, James Storm has never been so hot. Maybe I shouldn't have played it for her. I really like the storyline so far. My concern, I do not read spoilers, will not read spoilers. My concern is that this is going to Bound for Glory as Dan Lambert versus Jeff Jarrett over, uh, over the Lashley contract. Or Lambert and Lashley against Storm and Jeff Jarrett. That's that's my concern. I'm complete. I, I, I'm 100% making that up off my head. I don't know if that's true, not true, whatever. So that's what I'm kind of worried about because I don't know how good that that would be. But they've proved us wrong, you know, especially with the Steiner and JB match and all that. So we'll just we'll just see. We'll see what they're doing with this. Jim Cornette then meets with the roster. This felt really great too. The dirt sheets, the dirt sheets are so funny because they were just like, we don't know if Jim Cornette's going to be there long term because he wasn't even on the next episode after being on the first one. Da, 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 da. Like they're so stupid. Like even I knew, well, he's probably doing tape segments backstage. So if you've heard Jim Cornette talk and if you heard about my, you know, my assumptions and my predictions and all that stuff and what I perceive, I can tell that they're going with an angle with this authority figure where he's not being shoved down our throats. He's not kicking off the show in the ring. He's not out there to make a tag team match. Teddy Long. He's using used sparingly and as needed. So that's really good. You don't want him to just for every episode, you know, come out during the opening segment and make the main event. That's it's so played out doing that. So this is really good. I didn't like the background music. I thought it was a little bit cheesy but they've always done that they've always had the cheesy background music but i think they should have taken that out but this this was good um and he let them know this was their opportunity and there was going to be a surprise that night do you like my balloons so the first match of the evening first of two matches was ove versus the heat seekers i thought they said the thrill seekers at first i think that was like lance storm and chris jericho back in the day or something but the heat seekers so they even had a, a tag team name this match right here was exactly what OVE needed to do last week. Because last week was the worst debut I can think of any wrestler on a wrestling show in the, long, in the longest time. It wasn't that it was bad, but it was a two-minute match where the you know quote-unquote jobbers, even though those guys aren't jobbers on the indie scene, got in all this offense. They got in the first move of the match. I don't know what they were thinking when they booked that, but... This one right here was exactly what it needed to be. They got all their stuff in, and it was a, it was only like a minute longer than last week's, but it felt it felt like a lot longer because they did a lot of really innovative stuff. My only concern is that we don't have any heel teams. Like we have LAX and Followed by Mario Boca aren't really um, don't have a lot of momentum, and uh, I don't know if Idris Abraham and my man Hakeem Zayn are going to be a team cuz uh I talk with Hakeem Zayn and he's not he's not currently signed but he feels that there are plans to sign him. So I don't really know. Um I really thought OVE was going to come in as as heels, but you know, they 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 got an interesting look. I thought they got a lot of innovative offense in and I really think them versus Reno Scum, a lot of people have said it, but I really think that could sorry, my alarm is going off on my phone. I really think that could be something special because Reno Scum uses a lot of really interesting imaginative offense as well. So we'll see. But this was a much better uh, outing for Ohio versus everything. Their promo skills, they've been doing some backstage segments and they're not winning me over in that sense. But uh, the match was, was pretty good. Drake and Adonis went to Cornette's office, kissing ass. Um, this was hilarious to me. He was using the cheesy lines of that. That's a good suit on you. Have, have, have you lost weight? So that was, that was pretty good. Again, I think it's good use of Jim Cornette to have a little office and everything instead of walking around at the uh, backstage area. I think having him having an office with the bound for glory posters in the back was a really nice touch. And he told Eli, Eli Drake, if I give you a new number, will you leave me alone? I knew exactly what he was doing. So he swapped one and two. So um, I liked it because the narrative of coming in at one has kind of been done before. But ju just the fact that he switched them to two 
even though it's the same thing technically, but you know, it, it made it so he didn't come in at one and win. Taryn Terrell. <laughs> wow. Anyway, Taryn Terrell does a promo in the ring. Um, she comes out and I, I've been joking about Gail Kim coming out in her bra, even though she's not in a bra. I said that on Twitter. She got really mad at me. You disgust me. Taryn Terrell was actually on a bra. She was out in straight lingerie. And some people have been saying, well, I thought she found Jesus or whatever. We got to remember, folks, these they're playing characters on TV. They're still actors at the end of the day. Actors and actresses. And if you're watching a movie or a TV show, there's a lot of actors who extre- are extremely religious. But they, they play multiple roles. And uh, I had no problem with Taryn doing this. She's, she's playing a role, and this was her role when she was with the company previously. But I'm extremely happy she's with the company because I think she's the biggest knockout from the past that they could have brought. The The promo wasn't real good. I, I don't really... I know that's her gimmick and all, but when she does the... <laughs> uh, I don't really care for it. But at the end, she got a little more serious, and that's that's the kind of Taryn that I like. I'm interested to see where this goes forward because... It keeps Gail Kim out of the title picture, but it gives her some someone on her level, so to speak, that she can work with. And it's and and I mean, God, they've done such such great work together in the past. I have to think that they're building up to something really nice with these two. So I'm, I'm excited. She almost had a wardrobe malfunction. Gail Kim came out. She took off the heels. I thought surely she wasn't going to fight in the lingerie, but when she rolled out of the ring, I mean, she almost popped out of those things. So I think she needs to be more careful because there was definitely a nipple slip coming. But she uh, she covered up, took off. So this wasn't Taryn's best promo. She's been out of the game for a little while. But I'm still really invested in this. I just don't want them to bury the title reign of Sienna. Because you remember when Jade was the knockout champion. That was probably one of the worst title reigns ever. Because she was in the background of Gail Kim and Maria week after week. And we weren't getting Jade on TV. And then when Jade lost the title, she didn't get a rematch, which that's been happening a lot lately. We don't see Christina Von Erie popping up wanting her title that she had for 90 years. And you're supposed to be the knockouts champion? Um, Lashley meets with Cornette and America's top team. Yeah. I wish she would find some different verbiage to use instead of, you can't do both, you can't do both. This is what happens when you do both. They need to find some some new verbiage. I don't know what that verbiage is. The Taya Valkyrie video package gave me chills. I, I've watched that so many times. I thought that was the most badass video package vignette that they've put together yet. And I'm real excited for her. She's a great addition to the Knockouts. The Knockouts is stronger right now than it's probably ever been. However, a lot of the girls are kind of kind of part-timers, so to speak. And then, obviously, they signed... Uh, Hanaya and and Kira Hogan. We don't know what their names will be. I wouldn't be surprised if Hanaya is still Hanaya because she came from uh, Women of Honor and everything. But um, I don't know about Kira Hogan. I, I would imagine she will have a name change. But we haven't seen them yet. I don't know if we're going to even get them this, this set of tapings or not. But the Knockouts Division is looking really good. Grado comes out and says goodbye. I was okay with this. I've always said this storyline has been really, really hit and miss. There's there's parts about it that I really like, and then there's parts that I don't like at all. I, th- I think it's gone on a little too long. You know, I'm not saying super long, but maybe a week, week longer than it should. Maybe even two. But Grado comes out, and he's fairly over with the crowd, and gives this goodbye speech. When he started listing off the foods and everything, I thought that was really funny. My wife walked in at the time and overheard that and she was laughing at it because he was listing off a bunch of things that she likes to eat. I thought, I just thought this was a little long because you have the Grado and then you have Laurel come out and she does her thing and she comes out normal. So she's looking great in a, in a normal dress and we get the return of Laurel. And, uh, at first I'm like, okay, how, whoa, 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 what's going on here? (laughs) But then she said, great, oh, you may, I'm a changed woman because of you. So I hope that they go a little deeper with how she kind of transformed back to normal instead of just, just doing it. 
because my prediction previously was that she was going to stand up Grado at the wedding and uh, go back to normal, which I still think that's going to happen. Don't get me wrong. But uh, we get the, you know, the old Laurel back. So that's cool. And then she proposes and they're going to get married. And then Congo Kong comes down. So that's why I'm saying this was a little long. This was a little much. It could have gone a little bit faster. The Grado speech could have been a minute shorter. I don't know that Congo Kong was necessarily a, a necessary involvement. Maybe they could have done something backstage with that. But uh, we'll see where this goes. I, I can't imagine. Here's the thing, though. I can't imagine. I get it's kind of part of her gimmick now. But I can't imagine they're going to promote another wedding because it wasn't that long ago. It was like half a year ago. They did the Braxton and uh, LVN wedding. Are you watching one of Braxton's matches? Last time they promoted a wedding, everyone destroyed it on social media and I kept saying, just let it play out. And I still say that now. That's that's People say, how can you be so optimistic when they do stuff on TV that doesn't look good? I said, I, I always trust the booking. I trust how it's going to play out in the end. We've been very conditioned to have storylines rushed, 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 and these, they're taking their time a little bit. So just let it play out, and we'll see how it uh, ends up again. Ends up in the end. Then Cornette meets with Eddie Edwards. That was kind of unnecessary, other than him telling him, you know, I'm sorry you drew a crappy number. So, I, you know, it's a little bit of filler for me. They go to the LAX clubhouse. And uh, Homicide is not there. Homicide is with the company, but I guess what they did with this set of tapings is that they were just, even though they were doing marathon tapings, and I would have thought they would have brought more people. They, I, I guess they really looked at who's who's necessary for these set of tapings. You know, who's, who's going to help further storylines. They didn't feel Homicide was necessary for this particular set of tapings. And, that, and that's fine. We don't really know what the plans are for LAX's set of tapings and who they're going to build up against. So we'll see. But Homicide is still there. And I do like the LAX clubhouse segments because they feel real. And I like Diamante talking about the hoes and um, them making her money because uh, I've I've yet to find a woman, woman make me money. They usually take my money. The main event comes up, Gauntlet for Gold. And this what I want to do with this, I'm actually going to go one by one with everyone who came down and then kind of give my thoughts about how they did. And some might be longer than others, but I thought that was the best way for me to cover Gauntlet for Gold. They spoiled the win, or they spoiled the the uh, result of this online. I think there was two reasons. I think, number one, they wanted to beat the dirt sheets to it because we were all going to find out. It's, you know, someone like, you know, my little brother strictly just watches the show you know, keeps up with Twitter a little bit. For him, it's it's never he's never spoiled. Nothing's ever spoiled for him. I, I kind of envy that. But if you're like you know semi online, semi active on social media, you're gonna find out. And some people were posting it on my YouTube. And just so you guys know, when spoilers appear on my YouTube, I I do my best to delete the comments. I run my podcast based on what is currently going on TV, not what happens in the future. We're just we're just dealing with the present. Um, so I think they did it for that reason. And number two, I haven't looked at the ratings yet as I do this. I know it probably came out yesterday, so I might sound like an ass here because I don't know what the what the number was. But I think that they were trying to do a Mick Foley. We're back in the Monday Night Wars. You know, WCW said, "Oh, Mick Foley tried to spoil it." And said Mick Foley won their world title tonight, and then that was part of the uh, the shift. For people to go over to the WWF side or whatever it was called at the time. And everyone tuned in for that. So I think this is one of those things I think people are going to tune in to see the match and see how Eli won. And I think it's going to be a really uh, entertaining title reign. I really do. He's got the ball. They're going to see if he can run with it. I think he will. And this was necessary if we want to keep him in the company. So anyway... Eddie Edwards ends up coming down number one, and Eli Drake is number two. So both these guys, you know, that's usually how they kick off these kind of matches. Because this was a long match. This was like close to an hour. And uh, I think that's what the Rumble normally is. Or maybe a little bit longer, but considering they had ten less people, that's pretty impressive. So you got the two workers coming out first. Eddie Edwards is perfect to bring out early on. 
because he's a good worker and he can he can kind of go the distance. So Eddie Edwards got a lot of chops in and I thought he looked really good in the match. And again, I think he's just a perfect guy to bring out early. And I know he made it all the way through. But I wouldn't have been mad if Eddie won this thing. I was there when he beat Lashley. Um, I don't think he had the best title reign in the world. But I liked that he was champion and when he was champion. I was not anti-Eddie Edwards at the time. I love Eddie Edwards. I don't like his music. I don't like the ooh. Because, I mean, part part. Partially because the other wolf, Wolves music is like legendary. It's one of the best theme songs they've ever had, in my opinion. So I'm not a super big fan of his his music, but he's starting to get his he's starting little by little to get his own individual look because Davy's not around. There's no Wolves anymore. I don't know if he's gonna still do Wolves Nation and all that. So I don't know that the music fits him anymore. But he's got the jacket now, the AIP, the Mister Anything Is Possible is more the gimmick he's going for. But we haven't really seen him in a little while, so it was good to see him out there. And considering he was a underdog world champion, I think he was the right guy to put in there for the majority of the match. Eli Drake did a wonderful job through this match. He didn't do the the cowardly heel thing where he kept rolling outside the ring and hiding the whole time, and that's how he wins. He did do that a little bit. He rolled out once or twice, but he was in there working. If you saw Eli Drake at the end of this match, if you look closely, he was sweating profusely. His hair was just wet, flat on his head. So he was out there working his butt off. This was not a cheap win. Someone on Twitter, and I, I, if you think I'm a dick for this, I blocked someone for telling me that this was like the Jinder Mahal win. Saying that... uh, you know, they basically took a jobber and put the title on him. This is totally different. Jinder Mahal, they did that for alternative reasons for India. And he's a career jobber. Career jobber. Not, you know, like he came in. I was watching when he, back when he debuted a long time ago. And he was probably serious for a couple months. And then obviously, you know, went the 3B route. But he, he's a career jobber. Eli Drake maybe hasn't been book the best but he's not a jobber and someone who's who's a jobber goes out there and gets their ass kicked in about two minutes Eli Drake still put on a lot of competitive matches and he's also one of the most over talented and talented people in the company so you can't compare the two they're, they're nothing I understand Jinder's doing a great job with the title good for him you know I don't think he's still obviously they've done a really good job with him but I'm just saying there's there's no comparison. And the reason I blocked the person is because I, I've already had some issues with that person saying dumb shit and uh, just being overly negative over uh, on good things. And um, so I got rid of that person because you can have your own opinion. We can have different opinions, but do not come at me with dumb shit. I have a right for my Twitter feed to be full of competent wrestling fans, not people who come up with dumb shit. Number three was Mario Bokara. I mean, this is one of those guys, the crowd goes mild. <laughs> they haven't done a very good job with this guy at all. They made him and Falaba kind of a joke off the bat. I don't want, a joke in a sense, they just haven't been taken seriously. And I thought he was one of the stars of this match. He hit a couple of those German suplexes, and they were really nice. I mean, they were, they were impressive. And he hit them on, on big-time guys, too. I don't quite remember he hit one on eddie edwards i want to say he hit one on eli drake and i want to say he hit one on ec3 maybe but mario boger was out there for a long time and by all intent you know for all intents and purposes usually a guy like him is someone who comes in and gets eliminated within 30 seconds and there were times he was thrown out and got back in so he was treated pretty seriously i thought he was one of the stars of the match not because he stood out necessarily above everyone else, but the what we normally get from him, what we normally see from him, he exceeded that, exceeded expectations. Number four was Eddie Kingston. So Kingston has different music, different um, different look a little bit. You know, I, I don't believe it was the DCC music. I'm, I'm fairly certain it wasn't. Some of the guys didn't have the Titantron, Jumbotron, whatever entrances. EC3 didn't even have his. So 
at first when Kingston didn't have his, I was like, uh, because I always say it's a good sign when someone has the video package behind him. But I noticed that some of the wrestlers had it, some didn't. Kingston looked pretty good in this. It made me realize, man, I really hope this guy sticks around. And maybe, I think they could factor him into LAX. But he'd have to play a bigger role. like Because uh, Loki was like their single star, so to speak. And uh, I thought, by the way, with that clubhouse scene, I thought Loki looked a little like the odd man out. Like it looked a little awkward. The way he didn't even show him at first, and then it pans over, and he's just sitting there with his white ass shirt. But um, no, uh, Kingston, really happy to see him back. And you know, I think he lives fairly locally there. I think he lives in Orlando, so it's not a big deal for him to come out. And uh, this is probably going to be his only appearance in the tapings. But at least we see him and have some kind of confidence that he should have a role going forward. Number five is my man, Braxton Sutter. A lot of people are down on Braxton. I love Braxton. You know, um, I think I really got connected to him during that wedding segment uh, because I thought his, I didn't realize his mic skills were so good. So, and he's fairly believable. So I like Braxton a lot. He is my guy. I thought he looked pretty good in this. When he was eliminated, I don't quite remember remember how he was eliminated, but I didn't care for it. I thought it was a little, little f- forced. You know, sometimes there's a limit. There's eliminations and they'll look real. Like you could have obviously saved yourself. I thought his looked like that. I just don't remember what it was. I didn't write it down. But I always think I always thought Bra- Braxton got a pretty good crowd reaction because he's he gets people fired up when he goes out there. He's clapping and he's not just, you know, Jesse Goddard was another guy like that. He could fire up the impact zone regardless of how dead it might be that night. And I think Braxton has some of that to him. He just has to find the right right direction, right gimmick. And he's been doing this weird thing with Ali lately, but we haven't seen anything from it the last two weeks. So, But he's my guy. Uh, I would have been pretty happy if he won this thing. But he came in with a lot of energy. Next, number six was Dick Justice. So Dick, Dick Justice was the only, you can call him a, a jobber, you can call him a joke. You, um, I don't mean a joke as a person. I'm just, we're talking, you know, wrestling gimmicks here. Call him whatever it is. I was a little, I, I will admit, I was a little disappointed they used a slot on him. You know, I was talking to Marche Rocket and I. Um, this was about two weeks ago. And he said he didn't believe he was going out to Orlando. So I was really disappointed. But, you know, I would have thrown Marche Rocket in here. Shit. But Dick Justice was out Did there. Did you lost some weight since the last time <laughs> yeah, I saw you? Yeah. You know, I felt like he was... I, I thought he was funny. I thought it was some needed comedy. You know, it's, it's nice to have a little bit in there. You know, they didn't overdo it by any means. And he wasn't tossed out right away. But I thought what was funny was by the time he came down, entered the ring, walked to like four corners trying to tell people, I'm, I want to help you. <laughs> and you actually heard him say it to Kingston. Hey, I'm going to help you. And Kingston's like, get out of here. No one wants you. <laughs> By the time that all happened, the, the countdown started uh, ticking down again for the next person. So he didn't get any offense, nothing in there. So EC3 comes out next. And the reason I thought the Dick Justice thing worked, and what was cool too was he was doing his um, squats and everything. I, I just found him funny. But EC3 came down. And said, you and me versus all these guys. Kicks him in the nuts. Toss, tosses him. So it adds to the EC3 uh, asshole gimmick. EC3 in this thing. Maybe I have to watch this thing again. I felt like EC3 was getting his ass kicked through this whole match. Whether it was like Mario Bokora or um, you know Suicide who comes in later. Phantasma who comes in later. I thought... Every time I looked at EC3, someone was whooping his ass, and and most of the time it was someone who was way below him in the card. So, I just found that weird. I don't think this was EC3's best showing. I think he lasted long enough, though, to where, yeah, he's one of the top guys. I think he was top six in this whole thing. I, I, I think he should have been in the top four. But, you know, I don't think it was his best showing. I thought the way whoever it was he eliminated, I think it was Phantasma, and he comes in later, obviously. I think he eliminated with like a TK3 on the outside. So that was a really nice spot, and I liked it, but I thought EC3 could have been used a little bit better in this whole thing. So number eight is Congo Kong. He comes out, and 
you know, of course there's the, the I'm the big guy. I'm going to toss some people out. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the eliminations necessarily. I'm just, I'm just talking about the guys as they come down. So he tosses a couple dudes. I think he top, tossed Bokura. And, you know, of course, there's always the spot where everyone's trying to get the big guy out of there. And they were trying to get him out. And it was funny. They were trying to get easy uh, Eli Drake's help. And he wasn't having any of it. So it was good heel work by Eli Drake. Because he didn't form alliances in this thing. Except when uh, his boy came out. After that, number nine is Suicide. Suicide came in. And got a lot of offense, and he uh, he did his top rope gimmick, jumped on on everybody, did the whole one person jumping into a, a field of people and knocking them all over. I always thought that was so silly because you know think about a concert with someone stage diving. I mean, one person, <laughs> the guy doesn't jump jump off the stage and then knock everyone down. You know, once you got a handful of people, you're gonna catch that person. But you know, it's pro wrestling. It's whatever. What I liked was seeing guys like Suicide go out there and get offense on guys like EC3 and Eli Drake and Eddie Edwards. and They did a good job of just mixing up action between the lower card guys and the, and the top guys. And I really felt watching this thing that, man, there's really more people in the main event scene than I realized. There was, there was a handful. There was a lot of people. I don't want to say a handful. There was a lot of people who could have won this thing and got away with it. It's not like you're you're watching and there's only four main eventers and you just know you know you're just almost wasting your time because you know it's just going to be one of these four guys. It could have been any number of of people. Mahabali Shira comes comes down next and he has the the uh, stare off with Congo Kong, you know, and that's a real traditional thing where you have the two biggest guys in the ring come out and and look each other in the eye. He eliminates Congo Kong. I thought Kongo Kong went out a little quick, but I liked the elimination because, let's face it, last time we saw Shira, I, mean, I think he came out for, oh yeah, he came out during the Grado segment, didn't he, with uh, Kongo Kong, like Kongo, now I'm remembering, because I didn't write that down, Kongo Kong came out and Shira sc scared him off because he's Grado's buddy, but I thought the way he eliminated Kongo Kong was really necessary because if you remember, the last time we really had Shira was in India, they booked him to be a big deal. They put him in the main event match of the last episode. And, uh, you know, he had the big body slam on Kongo Kong. So you kind of had to keep this guy strong. He didn't last super long in the match, but you had to make him look strong. You could He couldn't come back out to, like, Jabber Shira. So I was cool with that. Number 11 was Chris Adonis. I just, man, I'm, I'm just not a big fan but I thought he did okay in this. And he was necessary to put out there so him and Eli Drake could be be a team. He didn't last super long, though. So they didn't really milk that that you know as much as they could have. Because they could have formatted this thing to where Chris Adonis helped them throughout the whole match. And then Eli Drake sneaks out the win. But they really made Eli Drake earn this win. Because Adonis didn't, didn't really last that long. Phantasma comes out. I'm very happy that he's back with this set of tapings. Very, I really like him. And from kind of seeing his tweets and everything, he looks pretty excited to be coming out with the company. And I think if anything happens to Lucha Underground, I think he's there's a good chance that we get this guy full time. But um, he was one of the most impressive guys to me out there. Everything he was doing looked really nice. He was hitting, you know, big big moves on big big players. And I felt like him and EC3 were going at it a lot in there. I, sometimes I try to pay attention. Who's who's really going at it one-on-one -on -one a lot? You know, maybe that's building towards a feud. I don't think they would do an EC3 versus Phantasma feud by any means. But I just felt like it was him versus EC3 a lot. And he was getting a lot in on EC3. So I thought he looked good. And it's time that some of these guys from Noah and crash not crash but um because that's they're kind of part of the company those guys uh triple a triple a almost said triple h um gets gets get some real wins against some of the bigger guys and everything but phantasma i thought was one of the people along with mario bokara who uh impressed me in this whole thing number 13 is johnny impact i'm okay with this name a lot of people don't like it 
Impact is the name of the show that we love. So how can you how can you say it's cheesy? <laughs> That's just me personally. I like it. I'm cool with it. I like the way, you know, they've had the John, Johnny Impact and he took his time coming out. And you could hear a legitimate crowd reaction. That's one of the best reactions we've heard from the Impact Zone in a long time. They were tra- chanting Johnny, Johnny. And uh, I was hoping they were going to do Johnny Impact, but it's whatever. They were really happy to see him. And I've said it several times on the podcast. If they didn't mess up Alberto El Patron's debut, like that place was on fire when he came out. Um, and I, I really wish I was on TV. I was I was so disappointed that uh, that got edited out. I didn't even notice that when he came out. I saw the the name pop up, but I, I didn't see that it was misspelled. But uh, the 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 reaction to him was really good. He went and got you know he got some of his classic offense in. Um, a little bit of it was a little bit shaky because he's still learning this six sided ring deal. And he has an interview with Josh Matthews which is really good. And he says he's there to stay because I know we're a little confused on him and Taya and what their contract situations are and everything, but he says he's, he's here to stay here to win the title. So he, uh, he, I, I think he was just such a great signing and I think he's going to do big things in the company. To me, it seemed like they're building towards him and Eli Drake at bound for glory. That's, they're going to put an XWW guy in the main event. That's, that's just what they do. <laughs> so I think that's what the main event is going to be. And I'd be okay with it. I think it'd be a lot of fun, personally. But the way he was eliminated, too, like he he flat back bumped on the outside when Eli Drake pulled him down. But that was really good, the way that um, Eli Drake went, th- went out through the second rope. Johnny Impact forgot he was out there. And he uh, eliminated him. But he was part of the last four. So you know he's kind of kind of a big deal. The you know company's going to do big things with him, but I had a lot of fun watching him. Uh, he's he's such an amazing talent. He's very special, um, and I'm definitely going to watch that Boone the Bounty Hunter. It, it looks it looks like it's got a little cheese to it, but I definitely want to see it. But he looked I thought he looked tremendous, and I've been reading and I'm sure many of you have as well that he really impressed during this set of tapings. So. Great signing. Garza Jr. comes out. Another guy with a lot of talent. And obviously, they feel that way because he came out there. And obviously, Laredo Kid was not part of this. But Garza came out. I enjoy his pants gimmick. But sometimes it's a little unbelievable because he takes too long. And it's a little awkward. But I like the way that Brax and Sutter... Try to try to get one in on him because last week it wasn't last week maybe the week before it wasn't Destination X it was like the week before where he tried to do the pants thing and instead he um, before he could do it he caught a couple super kicks or something like that so every once in a while someone's got to get in offense when he's trying to do that so it doesn't become too gimmicky but Braxton tried to get him and I think that's how he was eliminated actually because I remember I hated Braxton's elimination I think he tried to get one in on Garza. And ended up kind of looking like a fool and getting eliminated. So the Braxton Sutter elimination was my least favorite one. But mainly because he's my guy and I wanted him out there a lot longer. But I don't remember too much about Garza in this match. But he's he's an impressive athlete. And um, I think going forward, he, he's going to be a big player. Number 15 was Falaba. Falaba has been treated like a complete joke since the day he walked in the company. He continuously gets knocked off his feet he's been body slammed he's been Samoan dropped he uh he's a comedy character and I don't think that he should be so he looked good during this as far as going out there utilizing his size people being intimidated by him him getting offense in on guys and he he came he went out there like a fairly big deal him and Boca are both I thought were going to get eliminated the minute they walked out there. And Falaba looked pretty good. I'm happy to see this because I think that tag team has more potential. And they, 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 they can do a lot more in the ring than I realized that they could. So Falaba wasn't too bad during this thing. I was, I was happy to see him semi-serious. KM comes out. KM is you know positive that he's the next global champion. 
Cam is a guy that I like quite a bit. I want I want I I think he's very funny, but I think they have to turn down the comedy a little bit on him because a guy his size and everything shouldn't lose at the rate that he does. And he was another guy too that I I thought was in danger of being eliminated very quickly. When he when he did the thing, came in the ring and then stood on the ropes gesturing of the world title around his waist I thought they were going to dump him at that point but he went out there and seemed like a you know a big man wrestled like a big man and seemed like someone you know the announcers thought could win this thing which which we know that's not going to happen but Cam looked okay out there uh probably better than he he normally does when he wrestles 17 is Ishimori so I know they wanted to have international flavor in this i'm glad he's around for the tapings but he comes out and it's funny because De- desmond xavier wins the super x cup matt Seidel wins you know beats lashley and they're not involved in this at all so that was something i found kind of kind of weird uh, but ishimori comes out and he was he did a, he did a lot of good stuff in this i'm really happy that he's gonna be around for the tapings and who knows how long he is you know eddie edwards is like constantly in japan so maybe this is a guy that's really going to be constantly with us because marifuji even though he's better i i don't know how you want to say it. to me marifuji is phenomenal but he wasn't booked very well with the company but ishimori is booked a lot better and he really fits the x division you know currently what they're doing and everything so i am glad that he's around and he was he he was a uh, he's a good addition to the match. I just didn't really quite it didn't make sense to me. The minute I saw him, I was like, "Where's where's Desmond Xavier?" So he was number seventeen. Number eighteen is Lashley. I thought Lashley would surely be nineteen, you know, because we knew he wasn't going to be twenty. But I guess eighteen is not a a far cry. He comes in and he tosses KM and Falaba. So that's what the big muscle guy does. They come down, eliminate some of the big guys. He did it in a manner of saying, I'm here to win this title, and I'm here to win it quickly. Get out of my ring. So I really liked it. Uh, I think uh, it was uh, I think it was Garza that came off the top rope. Or no, it was Ishimori came off the top rope and, and took Lashley out. I thought that was a little unbelievable because it was like a sit-down senton where Lashley normally would catch the person, and you could powerbomb him, but took him down. Lashley's elimination by the next guy, Moose. Moose came in. I think Moose has a title run in him. And I think that is going to happen in time. Um, I'll talk about Lashley's elimination here in a second. Moose, Moose looked really strong. What I what I don't like with Moose, what I cannot stand, is that he consistently goes for his freaking finisher. And he misses it 90% of the time. And... What it reminded me of was if you watch, if you play like the wrestling video games, like the WWE 2Ks or whatever, and you're playing and and the minute you can use your finisher, you go for it. And usually when your opponent is too strong, they just block it. But then you just keep going for your finisher every every possible chance you can, you, you get. That's how I feel Moose wrestles. He's, he's consistently going for his finisher and he miss, like he misses it like no joke like 90% of the time it's it's the most unprotected finisher in wrestling and of course he went for it in this within the first like 45 seconds and i don't remember against who but you know of course he missed but other than that i felt like moose felt felt like a big deal in this match and the elimination he had of lashley because when they when they went toe to toe, face to face, nose to nose, loose um, loosely, Moose and Lashley, I, I didn't care because Moose's debut in the company, he went toe to toe with them, and you're like, oh man, this is a dream match. These guys have wrestled a few times. You know, they wrestled uh, one night only, a couple times on Impact, and Lashley always beats this guy, always, and. They did the same exact spot in this where that they'd done it one night only and they did on impact where Moose goes for his finisher, misses it, of course, and then lastly hits him with a spear that that uh, that sequence is insanely played out. So when they went toe to toe, I didn't care. I was like, Lashley's probably going to toss this guy, but they went at it 
Lashley went to the second rope. Moose did his drop kick that, you know, he does when someone's on a turnbuckle and eliminates him. And America's top team, America, yeah. they go crazy. They're pissed. And they attack the referee once again. I don't even know why Stifler was, <laughs> he came from the back and they, they attacked him. And Lashley was sitting out there for a long time. I don't know if he's in disbelief or what it was, but I thought that was the perfect way to eliminate Lashley. Because I don't think it made him look weak, but it, it, it they're doing a good job of booking Lashley to where, okay, he loses Seidel, he gets drop kicked out of the ring, where he's it's a mental game with him. And because maybe his mind isn't 100% in wrestling, he's making mistakes that he normally shouldn't. So I thought they did awesome with that. I don't think Lashley should have won this thing because we don't need another run. We need something new and fresh with Lashley, and I think that's what they're doing right now. To where he's not necessarily in the main event scene. And I th and I, it's nice. Sometimes we need our main eventers to, to step down just a little bit and let other people shine. So um, 19 was Moose. Number 20 was Loki. I'm watching Loki during this thing. Uh, he had a pretty pretty nice Warriors way on, um, on Johnny Impact. I don't know if he was slingshotted in the corner and then jumped off and hit him with it, but... Uh, man, seriously, just watching Loki, I was like, man, I just wish this motherfucker would figure it out because I thought he looked good. I thought he, I, I, when I was watching the moves he was doing, I was like, man, I want this guy around. I'm really disappointed with how that's working out. From what I understand, he's still under contract. He wasn't granted his release. He's on contract through October. So maybe they do something with him. Maybe they find a way to keep him, but the tapings are already in the books. He didn't want to do Ultimate X. Wants to be in the world title picture, which I think he should be. I just don't think he should main event bound for glory. And I know he was upset when he got to Orlando and find out found out there was going to be no world title match. But I thought they did right by him by making him number 20. At least by storyline and, you know, just booking reasons like make the guy number 20. It makes a lot of sense. It's very fair. The only thing I didn't like with Loki... Uh, I liked how he entered the ring through the other side. I thought that was funny. What I didn't like is I thought he didn't last very long. I thought his elimination was fairly quick. So that was that was the only thing I didn't care about. You know, it's almost like, okay, well, here's number 20 for you, but you're not going to last that long. So I know it said the match was an hour earlier. It was a little over 52 minutes. And it gets down to Eddie Edwards and Eli Drake at the end. Uh, num guys number one and two. And I thought it, this is what I like about the gauntlet. I really like how they do the one fall to a finish at the end. And Eli Drake never, he didn't cheat throughout this whole thing. I mean, he, he did heal things and you know, he's done, he's done it a couple times. He did it. He won bound for gold at bound for glory. So this apparently is his match. But when he, when he went on the ring and caught, held on with his feet, it's the third time he's done it. So I, I, I don't want him, want him to see him do it too much. But it's still a really cool spot. There was a point where he was falling out and Johnny Johnny Impact kicked his hands and he just moved his hands. There was one point where they clotheslined him over the top rope and he easily could have fell to the floor. But he held on. And I thought, man, what a talented guy. So Eddie Edwards from the top rope goes for a cross body block. Eli Drake catches as it rolls out of it. And then hits the uh, finisher, which at Bound for Glory, they, or a slam anniversary, I should say, call it the Eli Drop. I don't know if that's the name. But he hits that, you know, the Celtic Cross, basically, which I don't think is a good finisher. Uh, I like Blunt Force Trauma better than that, and that still wasn't the world's best finisher. So I think he still needs to find something like, that's what's, what's stopping him from really getting over, is just that badass finisher. Maybe he finds it during this set of tapings, but... I'm extremely happy for this title run. I'm excited for it. We're going to get a lot of Eli on the mic. I think he should kick, if I was creative, I would kick Adonis to the curb and replace him with a female. You know, But I would make it a storyline angle where it's like, okay, I'm done with you. I'm the champion now. I deserve a hot chick walking around with me. And I've always said Rebel's like the perfect person to, to match up with Eli Drake as the whole ballet thing. That would be his Miss Elizabeth, so to speak. But this should be a great title run. A lot of us really wanted it. We're getting it. They listened to the fans and they said, okay, let's roll the dice. I kept saying when they were going to crown this champion, they had to do something big. They couldn't just 
do something safe. I, I think even Moose winning the title would have been safe. So this was the right guy to do it as far as let's get people talking. Let's see what he can do with this title. He could have a tremendous run. I think that he will. I think we're going to get a lot of really entertaining television coming up. And I think he should win. I think he should hold it for a long time. I think he should be the guy to break Bobby Roode's record. I thought Mike Bennett was the guy at the time. I, I made that prediction early on. I think he's going to win a title and break Bobby Roode's record. Because they're going to break Bobby Roode's record sooner than later. They have to. Because he's, you know, doing big things on another company. And the wrestling companies tend to do that where there's a where there's some kind of record that is on their books that they kind of want to erase. I think Eli Drake is going to be the guy who does that. I 100% think that. I think he will win it bound for glory. And I think he will just continue um, to do it. As long as the company feels like he's, he's doing great things with the title, I think he's going to hold it. And, uh, you know, after doing the Patron thing, El Patron, where they're telling us, hey, we're going to shove this guy down your throat, even though they thought he did great work, don't get me wrong, they go from, okay, we're going to shove El Patron down your throat, and he's ex-WWE, and we're going to go back to that formula. That didn't work. So now they say, okay, we're going to use one of our guys, the guy you want, and make Impact great, so to speak. So um, that's it for me this week i hope you guys were able to hang on because i was doing this solo and usually i go back and forth with someone but i just for me i could not go back and forth with uh someone talking about this gauntlet and especially since there was only two matches that just didn't it didn't feel right for me but i'm interested to see where they're going i've been really excited the last two weeks so we're see we're gonna see what they do with this Thanks for tuning in, my peoples. This is BQ. And again, however you're listening to me, please hit the subscribe button. And I will talk to you guys next week. Peace.